As photographers, we're always interested in what other photographers are using in their kit bag. What is it that this person uses to do X, Y, Z? How do they achieve these particular images? So let's go through what's in my bag. I did one actually a few years ago when I first started the channel, but this is an updated version and you'll see exactly pretty much what I'm carrying around most of the time when I'm out and about traveling around the world. With regards to the actual bag that I use, currently I'm using a Think Tank airport commuter. It serves me most of the time, I would say, getting from A to B. I do have some issues with it in regards to when I'm going, for example, say uh, to Nepal, and then I'm off trekking somewhere. It's not very good when you're hiking around. It's okay going from A to B on public transport, be it train, be it plane, whatever it might be, but when it comes to then going out in the field, it's a little bit different. But anyway, that's, that's a, a little gripe of mine, and that's actually camera bags in general. But let's actually look to see what's inside my camera bag. I've got a varying uh, array of lenses that I carry around with me, seven at the moment. So when it comes to camera bodies, what I'm using currently at the moment, my main camera body is a Canon 5D Mark IV. So I got this in 2018. Before that, I was using a Canon 5D Mark II. And then when I first started on my photography journey, I was using a Canon 350D. And just as a quick aside, I'm actually selling images from every single camera. So it goes to show you, you don't necessarily need some 60 megapixel camera just to sell images. I'm still selling images from a camera from 17 years ago at eight megapixels. So just bear that in mind when you're thinking about buying your next camera. I also have another camera body and that's a Canon 6D. So it's an excellent little camera. I think it cost me about 1200 pounds when I bought it and uh, it serves me really well. So you might think, why do you have two camera bodies? Why do pros carry two camera bodies? Well, if this one fails, I've got a backup. Or in my case, what I'm doing is the 5D Mark IV will be doing stills, for example, at times, and then the 6D will be doing time-lapse photography. So that's how I'm using the different camera bodies within the setup that I've got. So yes, I do actually carry at times two tripods in order to do that. I'll come to my tripods later on though. Lens-wise, uh, you may have heard that a lot of photographers use what's called the Holy Trinity. So you have the 1635, you have the 2470, and then the 70 to 200. I'm slightly different in that respect. I've got the 1635, uh, the Canon 1635 f2.8 Mark III, I think it is. I've got the 2470, which is currently on the 5D Mark IV. That's the Mark II. And then I have a 100 to 400. I do actually have a Canon 70 to 200, but I haven't used it in a long time. I'm not sure whether to part with it or keep it. Not quite sure. I also have three tilt shift lenses as well, which I'll come to with each one. But I'll explain each lens and why it is that I use each particular lens. So starting off with the 1635, so there's my 1635, it's a bit of a beast. I used to have a 17 to 40, but I, I swapped it out for that. Why? Uh, ever so slightly wider, but f2.8, if you're doing astrophotography, be it, for example, stars or maybe even the aurora in northern Norway or Iceland, somewhere like that, f2.8 at uh, it's 16 millimeters, fantastic in order to be able to get very wide angle shots and not be able to use uh, a very long shutter speed so you're not getting star trails and stuff like that. Also useful for me at times doing inside cathedrals and churches. So if, for example, you go into a cathedral, you look up at what's called the transept. So where the nave is, where you walk into the, the main entrance of the cathedral, you go straight down the middle, down the nave, and where you arrive in the middle just before the choir and where the priest would stand, if you look up where you've got the cross, there's your transept. So at times that's really useful doing stuff like that. I've used it in all different scenarios as well. Maybe even a little bit of portrait here and there, but yeah, the 1635. Now, the next focal length that I use is 2470. I actually have two 2470 lenses, which may seem a little bit of overkill, but Bear with me on this. So the main one that I use is the 2470 f2.8 Mark II that's on the front of the, the 5D Mark IV. Why do I use this? It's a fantastic focal length. They call it the wedding photographer's lens. And it's fantastic for doing landscape photography, to doing a little bit of architecture here and there, to doing portraiture, 
to doing uh, a little bit of telephoto landscape photography and, and just other stuff as well. It's great lens. It's an amazing lens. It's well worth spending that extra money just to be able to get a faster lens. However, one of the things that it doesn't have is image stabilization. That's where the F4 comes in. So I have a 2470 F4, which has image stabilization on it. So I've been using this actually a lot in Vietnam recently when I've been doing some portraiture in low light. And what that's enabled me to do is when, for example, I just want that little bit extra uh, to be able to pull out of my images, it gives me that stabilization. Now, I know some people could say, well, why don't you go with the Canon R5 where you get in-body image stabilization, the lenses have stabilization as well, and therefore you're sorted out. It's just called balancing your time, money, and funds with all this type of thing. So personally, will I go to mirrorless at some point? We all will, by the looks of it. We're gonna have no choice. Right now, my Canon, my Canon 5D Mark IV, that suits me very well. So at the moment, no, I'm not going to mirrorless. So that's the 2470 focal length, fantastic. And also doing panoramas as well. You can get excellent panoramic images out of the 2470, starting from 35 millimeters, going to 50, going to 70. That then nicely brings me to the last zoom that I carry in my camera bag all the time, which is the Canon 100 to 400. Again, it has image stabilization. It's the Mark II. The Mark I, you would have to push and pull in order to get the zoom to work. Here, it's just a regular type of zoom with the Canon 100 to 400 Mark II. Fantastic lens. I've used this for doing the Tour de France. I've used it for doing portrait photography. I've used it for doing panoramic images. I've used it for doing landscape photography. So it's fantastic, for example, if you, could, if you were to go to Tuscany, where you get these really nice rolling hills and stuff like that, you can really compress the landscape together in order to be able to get some fantastic images of the Tuscan landscape. So just try to get my, my lens back in there. You can see how tight everything is in my camera bag. So that's the three zooms. So what's after that? I've got, or I should say it's three zooms, but it, one of them's a doubled up. After that though, there's an accessory to come up and then after that, there's the tilt shift lenses, which I'm sure a lot of you who follow me will know that I use all the time. Let's get on to those tilt shifts. For those of you that have been following me for a while now, you know that I use tilt shift lenses a lot. So as a Canon user for the last 17 years, I personally have found the, the Canon system great for tilt shift lenses. They've got five different tilt shift lenses and there's rumor as well that they're developing for the R system and on autofocus tilt shift be fantastic if that is correct, that rumor. But I personally use three. And I'm often asked by people when I'm doing presentations of my work, where do you start with tilt shift lenses? What's the best focal length to start with? My personal recommendation to you um, that's in my camera bag that I started with is the 24 millimeter tilt shift. So I bought this used uh, about in 2014 and um, cost about 1200 pounds, I think it was when I first bought it. And it's a, a lens that does me really well for a lot of architecture. I would say it probably does 70% or so of what it is that I need to do uh, with a tilt shift lens, I can do with this lens. So that would be doing things like naves inside cathedrals or churches. It's fantastic for doing that. When you go into somewhere like my home city of Salisbury, when you go to the cathedral there and you see this beautiful 14th century nave, and you just, if you put converging verticals on it, it's almost criminal to, to do that to this beautiful building that's there. And so once you start using a tilt shift, as the guy said to me when I bought it, he said it will forever change the way that you take images, and it does. You start seeing things very differently with tilt shift lenses. So I would highly recommend that if you were to start with a tilt shift lens, start with a 24 millimeter tilt shift. It will do you most of what it is that you want to do. However, during the pandemic, when I was stuck and I couldn't really go anywhere at all, I was pretty much stuck in France for most of the time, I started discovering a lot more of my surrounding area and that included a lot of the churches and cathedrals. And I was trying to find the ones that were beautiful to photograph. I really wanted to go and see them because they are really beautiful. They are absolutely amazing to see if you know where to go. So what I was finding is at times I needed to either go wider or longer. For what it was that I wanted to do. 
So wider, what's the solution? Well, I went to the Canon 17 millimeter tilt shift. This lens here um, is fantastic for doing, uh, getting those wide shots, for example. If you're outside, um, if you're in a small town and you've got this beautiful west front of a cathedral or, or a church, it's certainly over here what you'll see with the Romanesque cathedrals and churches is the west front is, can be really beautiful. But the 24 was just actually too long and I needed to get wider. And so that lens there, the 17 millimeter lens, it helped a lot. Now, I don't believe I've ever really shown on one of my vlogs what the lens is actually like. You have to be very careful with this lens. It has a bulbous front to it. So you can use filtration on it. So there's a Lee filters, as I struggle to put the lens cap back on. There's a Lee filters um, adapter that can go onto the front and then you can use grads or you can use a polarizer. But the thing I will say with that thing, although it's, it's okay to a point, the big problem is, is that it can vignette really heavily. So be very careful when you're using that particular lens with filtration. I don't know if any other camera manufacturers out there, uh, camera filter manufacturers, I should say, have, have dealt with that issue. So we'll see. But yeah, the 17 millimeter, fantastic. For, for getting those west fronts of cathedrals and stuff like that and other stuff. So, and of course, landscape photography. Now, the other thing that I use all of my lenses for is doing time-lapse photography. So when I went to Florence a few years ago to do a week's worth of time-lapse, one of the things that I found is that the particular hotel I would stay in, which had an amazing view of the Duomo, the problem was that I had is the 24 millimeter was too long to get everything in to do the time lapse that I wanted. What was the solution? Well, at that time, I hired the 17 millimeter to actually get the time lapse that I wanted that I'd seen in my head. So I hired it for a week, went to Florence, came back and then sent it back. And then forever in my mind, I was like, I want it, I want it, I want it. And eventually I got it. Then that moves nicely on to the 50 millimeter tilt shift. This lens took me six months to find. It is an absolute amazing lens. It's incredibly sharp. And uh, I use it again in cathedrals and churches and, uh, and other places as well. It's good for doing um, uh, stitch pan panoramas with it as well. So, you know, you can put your camera in portrait orientation and then shift the lens across from side to side, from left to right or right to left, whichever way you want to go to. And yeah, so this particular lens is very sharp it's excellent for for doing uh, other architectural stuff so i really could not be without this and then that neatly moves on to an accessory i guess it's is it a lens is it an accessory i don't know and that is the 1.4 extender now this 1.4 extender ordinarily people will think of it on the front of your 100 to 400 it doesn't go on the 2470 it doesn't work however although it is absolutely fantastic for giving you extra reach on the 100 to 400, which becomes 140 to 560. It's also unofficially able to be put onto tilt shift lenses. So I wouldn't use it on the 17 because it would roughly become 24 and I've got a 24, but if you put it on the 24 millimeter, you get 35 roughly. And if you put it on the 50, you roughly get 75 millimeter. Are those focal lengths useful? Absolutely, sometimes 24 is too wide, 17 is even wider again, you don't need that, but 35 is just right, just really what it is that you want to. So that's excellent for giving just a little bit extra reach when you need it. Then you move on to the 50, which then, as I said, becomes roughly 75. And again, you can get just that little bit extra reach with this. And certainly you might think, well, where would you use it? If you go again, into a cathedral, for example, a huge cathedral, and you look down the aisle, which is on the side of the nave. If you look down that aisle, you've got all those beautiful columns going down there. You can then bring everything together, compress things together with that by using 75 millimeter tilt shift, and it looks amazing. So that's my lenses. That's all the lenses that I use and the camera bodies. Let's move on to a little bit of, of the accessories that I use. So when it comes to accessories, a lot of us photographers will carry accessories around, various things, the memory cards, the batteries, etc. What am I carrying? Well, I've got in my camera bag a number of different memory cards. So I'm mostly using SanDisk. I do have some Lexar in there as well. And also there's about half a dozen batteries that I carry around. So 
If you're doing, like I am, a lot of time-lapse photography, it will eventually start to eat into the battery. Even worse, of course, if you're on mirrorless, hopefully they'll sort that out at some point. But I carry that many batteries because if, for example, you're going to Nepal, where you've got a weight limit on the a weight limit restriction when you're flying, be it Turkish Airlines or when you get into Nepal and then fly an internal flight, you need to start decanting things from your bag. You just can't have them around. So when you need to reduce weight, have to take, for example, I've got my laptop, which I'll explain in a minute. Um, when you have to take stuff like that out of your bag, test about two kilos there, and you start reducing the weight, then you think, well, what can I do to have my images safe by more memory cards? So for example, when I went to Nepal this year, I bought an extra few memory cards, an extra 128 gigabyte cards. I've got some 64 and some 32. And those allowed me to do all the stills that I needed to, as well as a lot of time-lapse photography up in the mountains in Upper Mustang when I was up there. So that's why I've done what it is there. However, I'm also using filtration, like a lot of photographers. When I first started out, pretty much the only brand you could really be looking at was Lee for ND grads and then I used a helio pan polarizer but now I'm happy to say I'm actually uh, a global ambassador for case filters so you would have seen for example on the front of my lenses I've got the case filters lens cap there and then the step up rings as well so they're extremely useful those magnetic lens covers and the step up rings so the really nice thing for me about the case filters is they fit very neatly into my camera bag. So that middle section there that's got my camera, a lens, another lens there, it's the same width as, what it, as the middle section of my camera bag. In here, in this neat little pouch, in this neat little pouch, I should say, it's uh, the Wolverine series, I believe. And um, there's, it comes with four different filters. So there's a polarizer, there's a three-stop ND filter, a six-stop ND filter, and a 10-stop ND filter. So you've got four different filters that are there. I also, as you saw on my last video, I have a variable ND in there. Uh, I think it goes from one to five, something like that. I can't remember off the top of my head, but I've got that ND filter in there, that variable ND filter. And I also have, uh, for, from time to time, when it suits me to use it, I've got a, uh, an IR filter, an infrared filter as well. So I need to get myself learning a little bit more about the infrared side of things. But um, so it's basically on the processing side for me. I want to be able to understand more about how I should be processing those images. But yeah, there's, a, there's the IR720 that I've got from Case. So I'm really happy as I said, to be an ambassador for Case Filters, a global ambassador. Uh, they make great stuff. Personally, I find as a company to deal with when I need them and I need to communicate with them, they are there. My contact in China is on the ball and I have to say that uh, she is amazing, Flora. So thank you for that, for what it is that you do. So let's move on to uh, a couple of other things in the bag. So if I was to go into the top section of my bag, I've got a poloscope there. So I do astrophotography from time to time. I need to do more. I'll come to what it is I use for that in a minute, but there's a poloscope that's in there. I've also got, just because I wear glasses, I've got just uh, something to, to clean my glasses. And then in the other pouch that's in my airport commuter, my think tank airport commuter, then I've got a gimbal. So I've got a DJI gimbal in there, which I can just use on my phone if I want to do some crazy footage. If I'm on, for example, the back of a motorbike, going around Hanoi or, or other stuff, um, it's useful for doing that, useful for doing uh, Instagram reels as well, just to make it a little bit different. If I can get the pouch back in there. So let's just get that back so it can neatly go back in my camera bag. And then, uh, because I fly drone every so often, I also keep in my camera bag my iPad. So I've got an iPad mini and that stays in there all the time. So it doesn't add much weight at all. And I mentioned earlier on, of course, I've got my laptop, which I'm carrying around. So I carry a 15 inch MacBook Pro. So it's late 2015 model. I think it is. It serves me really well for when I'm on the road. So I can be answering my emails. I can be processing if I need to. I can be starting to sort out images. So I also, I haven't got it here. I've got a travel hard drive for me, what I call my travel hard drive. It's just a, a Western Union, um, not Western Union, Western Digital hard drive that I carry on, four terabytes, so I'm able to get images off my camera. And then what I do is I will uh, put them on the hard drive and then just sort things out into the different folders on my hard drive. And then when I come back, 
then I put them on my main hard drive and then everything is where it needs to be. So it could be a folder for time-lapse, could be a folder for panoramas, a folder for HDR, etc. all that type of stuff. So that saves me a lot of time by having a laptop when I'm out on the road. So I've mentioned uh, astrophotography. So last year, a device that I got, which I haven't used a lot to be honest, and I need to use more and want to use more, is I have a move, shoot, move. So this little device here, this enables you, if I neatly unpack it, um, it, this enables you to track the stars. So it's a star tracker. You can do time lapse as well, I believe, on this as well. I haven't used it for time lapse. I've got something else, which I'll explain soon. But I've got this uh, amazing little device for tracking the stars. It weighs, I think it's something like 300 grams. It's not a lot at all. And um, it really is fantastic. I used it a couple of weeks ago, actually, in the, in the Dolomites, or about a couple of weeks ago, about a month or so ago in the Dolomites. And I did... Um, a couple of tracked images, one which I would say turned out good, and another which not so-so, but that's just getting used to the device. So yeah, you can buy this. It works in the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere. When I'm in the Northern Hemisphere, so that's what I'm using it at the moment. And um, it comes with a laser pointer, if that's legal in your country, that you can buy a laser pointer to help you polar align it to the North Star. So it's absolutely fantastic. And that is inside there, that's the laser. So extremely powerful laser. Don't uh, point it at airplanes, otherwise you'll cause a crash. But that little device there, that's the move, shoot, move. So that's absolutely most of what it would be that I'm carrying, I would say, the majority of the time when I'm out and about traveling. So I've got a couple of other things that I want to go through. Let's get to those. So I've mentioned a few times during this blog that uh, I do time-lapse photography. Again, if you've been following me for a while now, you know from some of the B-roll that I put into my videos, my vlogs, that I do time-lapse photography. I do it commercially as well, so every so often I'm employed to do time-lapse photography for different businesses. So you can do lockdown shots, lockdown just being the camera is fixed on a particular point, and that's it. You can do what's called the Ken Burns effect if you want to, because then you can zoom in or zoom out digitally. But if you want to pan, really the best way is to get yourself a dedicated panning tripod head. My personal preference to use because it's absolutely rock solid is the Kessler second shooter so you have to buy this case as an extra the hard case but when you're traveling around uh, this has been in a number of different airplanes going from country to country it's nice good solid plastic and it's protected so inside is the uh, is the second shooter so here is the second shooter probably a good kilo or so in weight or more and um, it's able to pan left to right or right to left, up and down or up, down and left to right, however else you want to do it. And it also goes on a slider. I've got a slider uh, tucked away that I don't actually use that often, but I have recently used it to do something for case filters where they asked me to film uh, a new filter range that they were bringing out. So they said, can you film some footage? And it's like, yeah, sure. And I use this to help pan the camera like this from side to side and then also from left to right and right to left just to get a little bit of motion within the video. So that was extremely useful to be able to do that. So also in that case that I've got to carry around, if I'm having to use this, there's, uh, there's the controller there for, for the second shooter to be able to program in what it is you need. And then there's also a spare battery there as well. So that enables me to be able to get some motion within my time-lapse photography. That's the Kessler second shooter. So I've had it now for six years and I have to say it served me extremely well to be able to have that in my arsenal and as I said just adding in motion to time lapse it's not the same as if you were to pan digitally like the Ken Burns effect where you can zoom in or out panning from left to right digitally it is not the same as using this uh, and actually having it so certainly if you've got a wide angle shot that you pan with this and I'll put up some b-roll when I'm talking as well of something that I did in Amsterdam, which I think is done on the 24 millimeter tilt shift. Um, it's panning across a canal, and you'll see the difference of having this in your arsenal. It is absolutely really essential to if you're doing commercial work. Last but no means least, and absolutely important when it comes to photography, is having a good solid base from which to work from. So I I am a Benro ambassador. I am very proud to be a Benro ambassador. 
and I have been now for four years. Their gear serves me extremely well. I'm very lucky that Ben Ray sent me two tripods to use in the beginning when I became an ambassador. Why do I have two? Because, as I said earlier on, with my camera bodies, one is doing stills at times and one is doing time lapse at the same time. So when I'm doing stills, the camera's clicking away over here doing time lapse and I'm able to concentrate then on doing stills. So that's why I've got two tripods. They're exactly the same. What are they? This is the Mac 3. I don't remember the exact model number of it, but you should find it with Mac 3. And then I have the geared head. So I have the, it's the GD3 WH geared head and fantastic again, because it's very precise, it's very light as well. So as a travel photographer, of course, when you're traveling from A to B, you're traveling in a plane, there's weight limits. Therefore, when you come across these weight limits, you need to try to think of all the time how do I reduce things down in order to get through the luggage obstacles, as it were, of the different airlines? Because there's many different luggage uh, limits that you'll fly. So I fly SkyTeam a lot. SkyTeam has 23 kilos in the main for your suitcase and 12 for hand baggage. If you go to somebody uh, like Turkish Airlines, hand baggage is eight kilos. Four kilos difference, that's a lot. Go and weigh four kilos, see how much that weighs, see how much it is that you have to take out. That's four lenses, essentially, in a, in a lot of cases. So think about that. So yeah, this that's the tripod, absolutely rock solid. It's been all over, both of them have been all over the world with me, survived many different things. And it's only recently something had to be repaired, which is just this top plate here, uh, that basically I was on a plane that got caught in some crosswinds coming into Amsterdam airport earlier this year and my luggage was being thrown around in the hold. When I got back, this was bent down. There was that much going on uh, with our suitcases underneath the aircraft. So Ben Rowe very kindly replaced that for me. So remember that if you're thinking, oh, it's my tripods, you know, it's just not, not good anymore and it needs a spare part here and there. They can get you everything from the stickers that go on the side here to this plate here, everything you need, they can sort you out, give them a ring. Their after sales service is absolutely fantastic. Ben Rowe, they're not sponsoring me for this by the way, nor a case filters, yes, I'm ambassadors, but I have to say I use particular gear because of what the service is as well that I'm getting from the company. So both Ben Rowe and case filters give me excellent service as well. Now, there's actually something I've just jumped, coming to mind which I'll mention again because of the time of year that we're doing this particular video. So yeah, absolutely uh, fantastic. I've also, as you might be able to see here, I've got a ball head. Now, I don't use this very often, but I do use it on the Astro Map. And I need to, to weigh up whether it's better to be using this or try to use a geared head on the Astro Map. Now, I chose this particular head. So this is the, uh, the VX25 because again of the weight. So it's extremely sturdy. It holds a lot of weight. I can't remember the maximum that it holds, but it's something like 150 grams. So it's not a lot at all of weight that sat there on this uh, little device here that goes on the move, shoot, move. So again, I, I got that, as I said, for the astrophotography. So I've used it again in the Dolomites when I was doing the astro image that I was doing, which I'll flick up again, and maybe I've already flicked it up. But yeah, that's Benro gear, very good, very solid, very reasonable in price as well. It's not like other brands which I could mention and I'm not going to mention which charge astronomical prices for their gear. I'm sure it's absolutely fine, but I can tell you as somebody that's traveled in many, many different countries since I got this gear in 2018, that this has been through all sorts of conditions. This has been in ice. It's been in uh, very cold conditions in Mongolia. It's been in heat in Uzbekistan. It's been in humidity in Vietnam. It's been in rivers, it's been in the, in the ocean. It's fantastic and it keeps going and it keeps working. Highly recommend that if you were to go off and get yourself a tripod, go look at Benro for sure. I'll come to one last thing, which is I guess kind of part of my kit bag and I want to mention it because again, it's a company that helps me out and um, I think they're absolutely worth mentioning. I'll just do that final bit of kit and then I'll weigh my kit bag, my, I'll weigh my camera bag and I'll, then you'll see what it is that I'm actually having to carry around with me and then we'll finish the vlog. So the last bit of kit, as it were, that I carry around that without these I couldn't, certainly in some of the places I go to operate my kit, 
is I use a set of Valorette photography gloves. So I am an ambassador for Valorette photography gloves. So then again, they're not sponsoring this video, but I want to mention them because again, they're a company that as an ambassador, they are very good at communication with you. So personally, I love these gloves. I find them very warm. They do the job that they say they're going to do. They say, basically, as it says on the tin, as we say, um, they're excellent gloves. They're very warm, that I find. Um, I've, I used to have a, Mark, a pair of Markov 2s. Um, I can't remember, actually, the names. The Tinden, these are. The Tinden gloves that I've got here. And I found, actually, the Markovs are really nice, very snug fit on your hands. But I found these. I really like these. I was using these earlier on in the year in the Dolomites. And I actually need to get them replaced because I slipped over and then sliced through there. But it's still doing the job that I need to. But these Tinden gloves, they are really nice, really comfortable and really warm. So um, with Valorette, they're known because uh, you can operate your camera gear because you can take the thumb off and you can take the index finger off. So you can then get to the controls of your camera and then quickly put them back on again. So in conjunction with these in very cold temperatures, so for example, when I was in Mongolia in March 2019, I used a pair of Ulta over mitts, which I don't have to hand, but they basically go over the top of these. So it enables you to really keep your hands very, very warm and safe because the last thing you want to be able to do when you're going out somewhere, photographing, for example, an aurora in northern Norway or Iceland, is you don't want your extremities to become really cold. So I do use other outdoor gear, but that's for another time. But yeah, when it comes to your digits, you want to keep your hands warm when you're out and about in these cold climates such as Mongolia, Northern Norway, Iceland, etc., Greenland, wherever it might be that you're going where it's really, really cold, or even in the Southern Hemisphere. So I use Valorette, very proud to be a Valorette ambassador and happy to, to be using their gear. So from there, uh, all I can say is I hope you've enjoyed the vlog. You can see what it is that I'm carrying around. So one last thing just before I go, is this way my camera bag? Because I get asked so often, it's like, how much gear are you, how much gear are you actually carrying around? What does it weigh? Let's weigh it and see. So of course, when you're traveling like I am on uh, different aircraft, different airlines, there's different weight limits, you always have to think, well, am I within the limits? Am I going to be able to get away with this? So you'll see, and I know roughly how much my camera bag weighs, I'm over the weight limit for a lot of the airlines. However, I can kind of get away with it because I've got, uh, because I fly a lot and I'm a frequent f traveler, I can get them away from my camera bag and just weighing my suitcase. But when it comes to the actual weight of this, uh, as I said, a lot of people will say to me, it's like, how, how much gear are you actually carrying around? How much does it actually weigh? So let's make sure the thing turns on. So if I hook up my camera bag to this, ugh, and then pull it up, so with my laptop in, with seven lenses in there, currently it weighs approximately 16 kilograms. That's how much weight I have, I have on my back when I'm going from A to B. Now, of course, when I arrive at my hotel, etc., then the laptop will come out and one or two other things. But in the main, I'm carrying around about 14 kilograms on my back and I'm again I'm asked from time to time do you really need all of this do you really need to carry all of that around yes so for example last year when I was in Uzbekistan if I look at the EXIF data for all of the photographs that I took during my nearly month-long trip in Uzbekistan I used six lenses in order to be able to capture every image that I saw in my head that I wanted to be able to take so be very very aware that um, the, the more you get into doing travel photography and doing it commercially and wanting to get the best, the more gear you're likely to, to be carrying around. So that's what's in my camera bag. That's how much my camera bag weighs and a couple of other things as well, as I said. Um, so, you know, it is a lot of weight to carry around, but do I need it personally? Yes, it's what it is that I do. It, it's what I need to carry around. So I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you've enjoyed a look into my camera bag, what's in my bag, as we like to call these videos on YouTube. And so, see you on the next video, wherever it might be, wherever you are. Take care, folks. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate your support and, of course, the support of Benro tripods, of case filters, 
and Valorette Photography Gloves. So thank you so much, everybody out there. Take it easy and see you again soon, sometime, somewhere.